Yeah. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tova Lynch, and uh, this lecture is tonight uh, because we have an, a small organization, it's a volunteer organization, called the Canadian Jewish Experience, and this is one of the panels that we created. Our entire exhibit consists of nine panels, and it's nine themes that we researched as part of the sesquicentennial. Uh, the exhibit is currently from coast to pole coast, from Newfoundland all the way to Victoria. It is actually in Ottawa in three locations. It's at 30 Metcalf, which is two blocks from Parliament Hill. It's at City Hall and at the War Museum. And we are very much thankful to Chuck Friedman for offering this lecture. And I will not talk much more, but I will introduce to, to our MC, Canada's Rabbi, Rabbi Bulka. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tova. The red blocks aren't always right. Uh, Tova, thank you very much for, um, for, for arranging this. Uh, when I got the note from Tova about whether I would uh, chair this tonight, I was, um, you know, my immediate answer was, uh, was a yes. The, the first reason, of course, is because it's very hard to say no to Tova. But it's also equally impossible to say no to a person that I remember from my, when I first came here uh, around 50 years ago, and um, the name Lou Rasminski was on the lips of so many people. He gave us uh, such a sense of, of pride. I, I remember, I recall, um, uh, you know, over the course of time I've met many outstanding individuals and Lou is right there at the top. And when you combine that with his humility, he's actually over the top. So this was an, uh, an, an obvious no-brainer. It's a great thrill, actually, for me to be able to be the MC tonight. And also a great thrill to introduce uh, Chuck Friedman, who has uh, many highlights in his uh, career, has uh, worked at the Bank of Canada for 30 years, uh, retired in 2003. He was a deputy governor for 15 of those years. Uh, he's here, by the way, on a, uh, a happiness tour because he and Aviva just uh, coming back from the celebration of, of our mitzvah of one of their grandsons. So Mazel Tov, you can clap for that, that's fine. Um, uh, he actually has been the um, a consultant for the International Monetary Fund before making Aliyah to Israel. He's adjunct professor in the economics department at Carleton University. And most important of all, he was a neighbor of mine for so many years. He and uh, Aviva and I got to know him and love him. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Chuck Friedman to talk about a memorable individual in our community, Lou Rasminski. Thank you very much, Rabbi. It's an honor and a privilege for me to deliver this lecture on the life and career of Louis Resminski, a great Canadian and a Jewish icon. This evening, I plan to discuss Lou's role in the development of the post-war international financial arrangements, his career at the Bank of Canada that culminated in his role as governor of the bank for 11 and a half years, and his iconic importance and source of pride to the Jews of Canada. I'm delighted that Lou's son, Michael Resminski, and his wife, Judy, are here with us tonight. Lou's daughter, Lola, was unable to attend because of a long-standing previous commitment, but she will be, oh, there she is. She will be speaking to us via Skype a little bit later. And one of Lou's successors as governor of the Bank of Canada, Gordon Teeson, who's also seated in the front row, is here with us as well, and both he and Michael and Lola will make some remarks about Lou later this evening. I'd like to thank Canadian Jewish Experience and Tova Lynch for inviting me to deliver this lecture, the SJCC for providing a venue, Victor Rabinovich and Maureen Mullot for their assistance. I'd also like to thank my wife Aviva for, among other things, acting as my editorial consultant for this lecture. I would also like to note there is a full-length biography of Lou's life by Professor Bruce Muirhead. This book was very helpful to me in preparing my remarks and is ideal reading material for anyone who would like to learn more about the life and fascinating career of this great Canadian. 
Muirhead's title, Against the Odds, is an indication of the difficulty and unlikelihood of loose achievements in a more overtly anti-Semitic age in which anti-Semitism was a fundamental aspect of Canadian society. While it may be strange to those of us who grew up in recent years in a very open and multicultural Canada, there was a time not so very long ago that the notion of a Jewish governor of the Bank of Canada was very distasteful to some Canadians and to some politicians. We can be proud of how far we have come since those days. As you already have noticed, I use the name Lou to refer to Governor Resminski, and will continue to do so throughout this lecture. This was the way he was referred to by his colleagues at the bank and elsewhere. And although he was a man of high status and very dignified bearing, he was also very approachable and much admired by his colleagues at the bank. Let me begin on a personal note. I first met Lou when I joined the Bank of Canada as a full-time employee in 1974. Although he had retired the previous year, he still had an office at the bank in the archives section, and I was fortunate enough to spend time with him over the years discussing various aspects of his career. He was a charming man, full of anecdotes, and happy to answer questions and to talk about past and future developments at the bank. I will share with you this evening a few of the anecdotes about Lou that I remember from those conversations. First, some facts about Lou's early life. He was born in Montreal in 1908 and moved to Toronto in 1913. He attended Harvard Collegiate in Toronto and was class valedictorian. Even in his high school years, Lou was interested and involved in Jewish issues and in Zionism. His first proposed topic for a public speaking contest for city high schools in Toronto was Theodore Herzl and the Rise of Zionism. And his second proposed topic was the right of self-determination of peoples. Both topics were rejected and he was disqualified from the competition. Lou served its, as several senior positions in Young Judea, a Zionist youth organization. While in a position of leadership in this organization, he wrote that, and this is a quotation, it is tragic that precisely at this time, the Jewish youth should cease to be interested in its Jewish heritage and cut itself entirely adrift from any form of constructive Jewish life. He went on to emphasize the importance of education in preventing the weakening of Jewish traditional bonds. Lou entered the University of Toronto in 1925, specializing in economics, and was in a battle with Wynne Plumtree, who later became a top civil servant, to be the top student in the Department of Political Science and Economics. Plumtree won the Massey Scholarship for studying in Cambridge, Cambridge, England, while Lou, with virtually identical grades, was left without a scholarship, and his family did not have the means to send him to England or the United States for graduate study. Fortunately, one of his professors, recognizing his ability and potential, approached the Jewish community to request that they provide Lou with the opportunity for further study. Within days, enough money had been donated to the University of Toronto Political Economy Department to establish a, stud a scholarship for study elsewhere, and Lou was its first recipient. Thus, in 1928, he went to England to study at the London School of Economics. While he never completed his thesis there, it was clearly a fruitful period, and he was able to meet and study with some of the great economists of the period. Two years later, in 1930, he married Lila and joined the League of Nations in Geneva after beating out 300 other candidates for the position. Lou excelled in the practical applications of economics, and in almost a decade at the League was highly regarded for his technical work. He was able to meet many of the outstanding com economists of the generation during his time there. He also became intimately involved with the Jewish community in Geneva and in Europe more generally. Towards the end of the period, he helped Jewish refugees to escape from continental Europe for England and donated money to help them make the trip. Michael was born in Geneva in 1937. While Lila and Michael returned to Canada in 1938, Lou remained in Geneva until August 1939, just before the war. He then returned to Canada while initially continuing to work for the League. When he left the League, his supervisor wrote him, may I repeat now my appreciation for what I have always felt was the exceptional excellence of your work. The international experience and the expertise and contacts he had developed at the League would serve Lou well over the course of his career at the Bank of Canada. In the spring of 1940, Lou joined the Bank of Canada's Foreign Exchange Control Board as economic advisor. The board had been set up to deal with a wartime emergency controlling the outflow of foreign exchange from Canada. 
Lou subsequently served in increasingly senior positions at the board. During the early 1940s, in addition to his work on the board, Lou was a member of a committee that was set up to plan for post-war international financial arrangements. This work culminated in the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, a conference that set the framework for the post-war international financial system, including the creation of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And Lou was chair of the very important drafting committee of Bretton Woods. It is this part of Lou's career that we now turn. I once asked Lou how he, a relatively young man, had come to be named the chair of the drafting committee at Bretton Woods. He explained to me that while the war was still raging, a number of countries began to focus on the kinds of arrangements that would stabilize the post-war international financial system and help avoid the policy mistakes that exacerbated the Great Depression, most notably exchange rate policies and tariff policies. There were only three countries who were doing serious thinking about the subject, the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada. Lou was involved in many international meetings on the subject, and his understanding of the issues and his insightful contributions in planning meetings led to his being invited to chair the drafting committee in 1944. While the international discussions of post-war financial arrangements, which began in 1942, aimed at international collaboration, and establishing the rules of behavior, substantially different views as to how to achieve these goals were initially taken by the United States and the United Kingdom. Lou acted as the consummate mediator between the two countries over the two or three years needed to establish the rules of the post-war financial system and to set up the IMF and the World Bank. Because of his superior technical skills and because he had a better understanding of the American political situation than did the British, he was able to understand the limits placed on the American negotiators by their domestic political situation, while also understanding the needs of the British in the post-war period. Let me provide one example of Lou's role. Canada developed a plan which was introduced at a meeting in Washington in June 1943. At the end of a very long afternoon with rambling and diffuse discussion, Lou was asked to summarize the points made. He proceeded to provide an analytic summary of the discussion that lasted for 15 to 20 minutes and that terminated in spontaneous applause lasting another two minutes. In the negotiations leading up to Bretton Woods Conference and at the conference itself held in the hotel in New Hampshire in July 1944, the American delegation was headed by Harry Dexter White and the British delegation was headed by John Maynard Keynes, one of the most important economists of the 20th century. As negotiations continued, there was a clash of personalities between White and Keynes. It was not clear whether an agreement could be reached. As David Dodge, a later governor of the Bank of Canada, has written, Resminski played an important role, formal and informal, at the talks. Not only was he the chair of the drafting committee, he was also the peacemaker between the British delegation and the US delegation in the months leading up to Bretton Woods. It was Resminski who kept the two key delegations talking. Without his work, both as a skilled drafter and as a go-between, it's entirely possible that the talks at Bretton Woods could have ended in failure. Some further examples of Lou's roles and comments, by some, and comments by some of his contemporaries are of interest in this context. Sir Roy Harrod, a leading British economist, wrote, almost alone, outside the ranks of British and Americans, the Canadians seemed capable of understanding international monetary problems as a whole. Their suggestions were intelligent and creative, and the British and Americans were always anxious to have them. A member of the Brazilian delegation at Bretton Woods commented on Lou's role in, as mediator between Keynes and White. He could talk back to Keynes. He was bold enough to discuss with him and contradict him and had a much better view of the American position. Of course, he was much more than a mere mediator. He had credibility among the participants because of his obvious technical skills and his impartial and objective approach. Eddie Bernstein, a key member of the US delegation at Bretton Woods commented that Bretton Woods lose major roles making sure that any continuing arguments between the United States and the United Kingdom didn't stop the conference from getting the IMF created. In a subsequent visit to Ottawa, Lord Keynes, John Maynard Keynes became Lord Keynes, told the Ottawa Citizen newspaper, Canada played a very distinguished and dignified part all through Bretton Woods. Your Mr. Resminski rendered most Trojan service as chairman of the most important technical committee at the conference, and his tremendous assistance in that connection brought results which satisfied all concerned. A member of the Netherlands delegation said of Lou that he was brilliant, and a member of the US Federal Reserve Board 
noted that Lou should have been named the IM's first managing director, so great was his impact in 1944. Very high praise indeed. Lou also wrote an article entitled International Credit and Currency Plans, which appeared in the July 1944 edition of the prestigious U.S. periodical Foreign Affairs. Harry Dexter White, the head of the U.S. delegation, asked Lou for 100 copies to distribute, while Keynes spoke of it in highest terms. With regard to this article, Lou once told me that one morning, as he left his bedroom at Bretton Woods to, at the hotel to go to the general meeting of the delegates, he met Lord Keynes, coming from his bedroom. Keynes commented to Lou on how much he had enjoyed Lou's article and how he had planned to write Lou a note to that effect, but that writing such a note would make him late for the meeting that morning. As Lou told me, what he really wanted to say to Keynes was, why don't you go back to your room, write the note, and arrive a little late to the meeting. <laughs> in this case, as in so many others, Canada punched above its weight and played the honest broker role. Its ability to play such a role was based on the intellectual capacity of its representatives and their understanding of the issues and pressures on both sides. In the midst of all this, Lola Rizminski was born in 1944. In 1943, Lou was appointed executive assistant to the governor of the Bank of Canada. His work over the rest of the 1940s and through the 1950s involved watching over developments in international cooperation and reconstruction on behalf of Canada at the Bank of Canada, at the IMF, and at the World Bank. That is, in addition to his work at the Bank of Canada, Lou was also Canada's executive director at the IMF between 1946 and 1963, 62, and the World Bank from 1950 to 1962. The three positions that he filled by himself subsequently required three people to fill. From the Canadian point of view, the major financial development over that period was the floating of the Canadian dollar in September 1950. We now turn to Lou's career at the Bank of Canada over the years following Bretton Woods. On three occasions, Lou did not receive the promotion that many people thought he should have had. The first came in 1949, when Donald Gordon, who had held the number two position at the Bank of Canada's deputy governor, left the bank to become chairman of Canadian National Railways. James Coyne was appointed to the number two position at the bank on that occasion. The second came in 1954, in November 1954, when Graham Towers was about to retire after 19 years as governor. Coyne was appointed to the ne be next governor, effective January 1st, 1955, with Lou again passed over. And the third came at the same time, when Robert Beattie was appointed the number two, to be number two to Coyne, or senior deputy governor, a position that might well have gone to Lou. Lou was promoted to the newly created position of deputy governor in January 1955. There was considerable speculation that anti-Semitism had played an important role in Lou's not receiving one of the two top positions. For example, an article in the Canadian Jewish News in the issue following Lou's appointment in 1961 quoted Dr. J.J. McCann, a minister in the King and Saint Laurent governments, as having said in 1954, when he was first passed over, if his name had been Smith or Jones or perhaps even Richard, he probably would have got the job. The same issue of the Canadian Jewish News carried the headline, Ottawa Spurns Bigots. It is worth noting, as shown in PCO records, that the Conservative cabinet under John Diefenbaker had taken the position around the time of Lou's appointment that it would, quote, not be influenced by the possibility of criticism by anti-Semitic groups. More on this later from Michael Resminski. Among other noteworthy developments in the years before he was appointed governor, Lou was an advisor on the establishment of the Bank of Israel, received an honorary doctorate from the University of Toronto, and was discussed as a possible deputy managing director of the IMF. In sum, his focus over the period between the end of the war and 1961 was largely on international affairs. Although he had been promoted to deputy governor in 1955, it seemed unlikely that he would achieve a higher position at the bank. All that changed as a result of what came to be known as the coin affair. Coin, you remember, is the governor between, appointed in uh, January 1st, 1955. This, now we're getting to 1961, but it will go over, over what happened in the late uh, 1950s. There were significant differences in views in the later 1950s and early 1960s between the government of Canada under John Diefenbaker and the Bank of Canada under James Coyne. The government was more concerned about insufficient demand and unemployment, while the bank was more focused on the increasing inflationary pressures and their longer-term implications for the economy. These differences resulted in public disagreements. 
In this context, the government took the position put forward by the Minister of Finance, Donald Fem Fleming, that monetary policy was not the responsibility of the government. Rather, he asserted, the responsibility for monetary policy was entirely in the hands of the Bank of Canada. In addition, as governor, Coyne involved the bank in disputes with the government by taking positions that went further into the political domain than was typical of central banks. These included areas such as foreign investment in Canada and foreign ownership of Canadian companies, where he took a very nationalistic position. Strangely enough, the particular issue on which the battle finally rested was the, in the political domain was a technical one regarding the governor's pension. But this was a political sideshow compared to the substantive differences over monetary policy and other issues. In the event, the House of Commons passed a bill declaring the office of the governor of the Bank of Canada vacant. Coyne testified before the Senate, which rejected the bill, and then immediately resigned. The government then approached Lou to take on the position of governor. From the government's perspective, Lou had two notable advantages. First was the international recognition of his great ability. This was particularly important at a time when the domestic and international reputation of the bank was at a low point as a result of the coin affair. The second was they had not been impl implicated in the battle between the government and the bank because he'd been largely involved in international affairs over the recent years. But before Lou was prepared to accept the position of governor, he wanted an agreed and explicit understanding with the government of the respective roles of the government and the central bank in the monetary policy area. This understanding, which was incorporated into the Bank of Canada Act in 1967, was sometimes referred to as joint or dual responsibility. According to this view, ultimate responsibility for monetary policy was in the hands of the government. But if there was no fundamental difference in views, the bank had independence in implementing policy. Furthermore, if there should be a fundamental difference of views with respect to monetary policy, there was to be a formal arrangement in which the government could give an explicit directive to the bank instructing it on how to proceed. But that directive would have to be made public. And in such circumstances, the governor, having lost the confidence of the government, would almost certainly resign. Also, Lou believed that it was essential for the Minister of Finance and the Governor to meet on a regular basis, and this too was agreed. That was because the previous Minister of Finance and James Coyne did not meet very frequently. What was central to the arrangements proposed by Lou was that the government would require, be required to make its reasoning for a directive to the bank public, explicit and very public. And that would make it very difficult for a government to exert pressure into the bank for partisan political reasons. Interestingly, in the 56 years since this agreement on the relationship between the government and the bank came into effect, no such directive has ever been given by the government to the Bank of Canada. I once asked Lou where this particular formulation of the idea of joint responsibility for monetary policy had come from. He smiled and made it clear that it was his own idea. In a letter to the Globe and Mail in the mid-1970s, he explained that the agreement was a for formalization of what had been the intent of the government beginning in 1935, when the Bank of Canada was established, and that the Fleming coin controversy had been an aberration, and that new arrangements had restored what implicitly had been the case earlier. Lou's belief in the de facto independence of the Bank of Canada, not the de jure independence, but the de facto independence in the absence of a fundamental disagreement, in ordinary times, in other words, is illustrated by an episode recounted by Peter Newman in volume one of his book, The Canadian Establishment. It took place at a Canadian Bankers Association dinner in the early 1960s. Walter Gordon, then Minister of Finance, spoke first and ended his talk with the outspoken thought, well, we'll listen to you, Lewis, but I'm so plainly right, it's only a courtesy after all. Not very nice. Lou stood up, elegant as always, waited for the room to become completely quiet and said he would tell a story which he felt was all he needed to say in reply to the Honourable Minister. Lou had just returned from Europe and had been discussing with the government, governor of the Bank of France the relationship of the central bank with governments and cabinets. The French governor had said to him, Louis, we practice a fine profession. In assessing its merits, it might bear remembering that in the years I've been governor of the Bank of France, I've seen 22 ministers of finance come and go. With that, Lou bowed to Walter Gordon and sat down. <laughs> Lou was appointed governor of the Bank of Canada on July 24, 1961, 56 years ago tomorrow. Reappointed for a second term on July 24, 1968. 
He retired on his 65th birthday on February 1st, 1973, about four and a half years into his second term as a result of the ill health of his wife, Lila. When Lou was appointed governor, he became an icon for the Canadian Jewish community. The issue of the Canadian Jewish News reporting on his appointment had a front page article, an editorial, and a background article devoted to the story. The newspaper fo focused considerable attention on the breakthrough element of Lou's appointment, noting that Rizminski's appointment is a revolutionary occurrence. His appointment now is in line with Prime Minister Diefenbaker's Bill of Rights that there should be no discrimination because of race, creed, or color. As reported in the Ottawa Jewish Bulletin a little bit later, a testimonial plaque given to Lou at a communal reception honoring him and his wife at the Ottawa Jewish Community Center, not this building, but the old building, on September 6, 1961, read as follows. In tribute to Louis Resminski, distinguished public servant, whose life had been has been dedicated to the service of his country and fellow man, and recognition of his appointment of, as governor of the Bank of Canada, which does honor to him and all Canadian Jewry. The Jewish Community of Ottawa assembled this sixth day of September 1961 records its pride and affection and extends its warmest wishes to him and his family for every happiness and success. See how the relationship of the, uh, the community to Lou was. I particularly remember my father, an immigrant to Canada from Poland, marveling at the fact that a Jew could reach such a high position in Canadian officialdom. And my father was particularly impressed by the fact that not only was Lou Jewish, but he was well known to be Jewish and was actively Jewish. My father also knew he doesn't at the best shalom, but I never figured out how he knew that. As Professor Howard Edelman later wrote, in Canada, anti-Semitism had not just been the prerogative of extremist right-wing nationalists, but permeated the intellectual, professional, and political establishment. However, when I was in graduate school, Louis Rizminski's signature would appear on every Canadian dollar bill as he served as governor of the Bank of Canada. The times they were are changing. On the panel, right. With the elevation of Lou to the governorship in 1961 and other Jews to higher position in the later 1960s, and with the changing economic and social situation in Canada, the Jewish community in 1970 differed fundamentally from the same community as existed in 1960. Harold Troper has noted that when the doors opened, Jews who chose to pass through no longer had to park their Jewishness at the door as earlier generations had been forced to do. Suddenly, Jewishness was not something to hide. After Lou became governor, there was a period of confidence rebuilding at the Bank of Canada, both internally within the bank itself and externally in terms of the reputation of the institution. Also, given Lou's own experience and expertise was largely international, he now had to develop an equivalent competence in domestic monetary policy, which involved a fairly steep learning curve. Among the internal changes that were, instituted, that were instituted at the bank was the division of the old research department into three analytic or policy departments, international, monetary and financial, and domestic research. There was more decentralization in the bank's operations. The bank began publication of staff studies, introduced formal economic forecasting, and made increasing use of econometrics. Large-scale model building was also introduced. There were French lessons for staff and initiatives to increase the number of francophones and women in the bank. As Lou's successor, as Governor Jerry Bowie put it, through his various initiatives, Lou infused the bank with new life. People all had a view of what the bank was there for and what its objective was in a way that I think, this is Jerry talking, we never had under coin. More on this later from Gordon Thiessen about working on, at the bank under Lou. In October 1961, the government appointed a Royal Commission on Banking Finance, popularly known as the Porter Commission, after its chair. Its mandate was, among other things, to examine and make recommendations for the improvement of the structure and methods of operation of the Canadian financial system, including the banking and monetary system. The intensive discussions in the bank leading up to the preparations of the bank's written position and of Lou's presentation to the Porter Commission helped Lou and the bank in a number of ways. Many meetings were held with give and take discussions and Lou working shoulder to shoulder with other bank officials to successor. It was a great educational process for all of us, including the new governor. Given the tension between the economists and the research department and James Coyne, this must have been like a breath of fresh air in the institution. And the view that the new governor could be convinced by logical arguments and would not dismiss re respectable intellectual argument put forward by an official soon spread throughout the bank. The Porter Commission also dealt with the issue of central bank governance, 
It recommended formalizing the agreement on joint government and Bank of Canada responsibility that Lou had drawn up before accepting the position as government. And the Bank of Canada Act was amended to that effect in 1967. In 1963, just two years after Lou took on the position of governor, The Economist magazine wrote the following after the death of poor Jacobson, the managing director of the IMF. Quote, an outstanding candidate to succeed Jacobson from the American continent who could be counted on to develop the fund in a positive way is Mr. Louis Rysminski, who in the past two years has been picking up the pieces at the Bank of Canada and earning new respect in the process. The magazine noted that he combined technical ability and economic expertise with notable personal qualities and is a popular figure and went on to describe him as the best man available for what should be the free world's number one economic position. There were a number of major developments and challenges that had to be addressed during Lou's term as governor. The first involved the value of the Canadian dollar in the foreign exchange crisis in 1962. Given the weakness of the Canadian economy at the time, the Diefenbaker government tried to talk down the value of the Canadian dollar in order to increase exports and reduce imports. Eventually, in May 1962, the float of the dollar was abandoned and the dollar was repegged at 92.5 US cents, in line with international norms of those days and conforming to US requirements. In 1963, the Liberal minority government under Lester Pearson was elected with Walter Gordon as finance minister. The subsequent expansion of fiscal policy in developing inflationary psychology meant that the lone voice preaching restraint was that of the Bank of Canada. There were also a series of major challenges in those next few years resulting from U.S. economic problems on the international scene. Actions taken by the U.S. in response to these problems threatened to sideswipe the Canadian economy. It's like that classic argument, the U.S. The US has a cold and Canada gets pneumonia. <laughs> Lou played a crucial role in minimizing the effects of such American actions on the Canadian economy. In each case, he was involved in negotiations with U.S. officials and the U.S. government and played an important role in bringing about as satisfactory an outcome as could have been expected in the circumstances. Well, effectively, what happened in all these cases, and this would be 1963, 1965, and again in 1968, was that Canada was exempted from the U.S. initiatives and controls in return for a quid pro quo on the part of Canada that ensured that the, controls would not be circ the U.S. controls would not be circumvented internationally through Canada. A very important development in Lou's second term was the refloating of the Canadian dollar exchange rate in May 1970, in spite of opposition from the United States and the IMF. In the following year, in 1971, President Nixon untied the U.S. dollar from the gold standard and introduced an import surcharge of 10%. While the U.S. pressured Canada to repeg its exchange rate, Canada refused and the pressure eventually disappeared. Two years later, in 1973, Canada was followed by much of the industrialized world as the fixed exchange rate system originally established at Bretton Woods finally collapsed. On a personal level during those years, Lou was awarded a number of honorary doctorates, joined the board of Carleton University, on which he served for nine years, was, started, was awarded the Outstanding Achievement Award of the Public Service of Canada, and was named Companion of the Order of Canada. He was also invited to give the 1966 Poor Jacobson Lecture, a very prestigious annual lecture sponsored by the IMF to honor its late managing director. He chose the title, The Role of the Central Banker Today. His 45-minute wide-ranging lecture was a great success. Both of his discussants commented on the excellence of the paper, and in his closing remarks, the president of the Poor Jacobson Foundation noted that the response of this audience is a clear indication that Mr. Resminski has made a most successful presentation of this subject. In the latter part of the 1960s and the early 1970s, the focus of the Bank of Canada increasingly turned to fighting inflation. This was not just a Canadian problem, it was part of a global problem. And it took more than two decades before inflation was finally brought under control. Lou was very concerned about inflation and the long-run effects it would have on the function of the economy because of the distortions it would generate and the inflationary expectations that would become entrenched, while being aware of the short-run consequences for output and unemployment of fighting against inflation. But he was also uncertain, uncertain about the extent to which monetary policy could succeed in preventing these pressures from taking hold. One prescient comment from Lou's 1966 per Jakobson lecture is worth noting in the context of the developing global inflation problem. It seems to me that what is needed is not to decide how much inflation can be tolerated, but to concentrate on trying to find ways of making the economy work at satisfactory levels without rising price levels. 
is clear we have a lot to learn about living with prosperity without permitting it to generate into inflation. He also, sorry, I think I need a night chat. My glass has changed. He also commented pessimistically in the early 1970s that in a certain sense, I think it is really impossible to succeed at the job of being a central banker under today's conditions when economic arithmetic counts for so little and all the social and economic pressures favor inflation. Modern societies do not have the stomach to push monetary and fiscal policy to the point where market conditions will begin infl bring inflation to an end. And in 1973, he wrote, we are again, at least in my opinion, threatened with a degree of inflation which can undermine the achievements of the past quarter century. Prime Minister Tr Pierre Trudeau wrote to Lou upon the announcement in November 1972 of his um, upcoming retirement. The last two or three years have been ones of extraordinary difficulty for those responsible for financial or economic advice and policy. The governor of the bank has a position of unique responsibility and must have constituted a very great burden to you at many times. It was a great advantage to the government to know that decisions in, this extremely import, in the extremely important financial matters with which you were charged were being taken by a person of such capacity, integrity, and dedication to the public good. Lou retired on February 1st, 1973, on his 61st birthday, following Lilas being diagnosed with cancer. Lou's retirement was an active one. He served for four years as head of the IDRC, the International Development Research Center, succeeding Lester Pearson in this position. It allowed Lou to maintain an active interest in third world issues. He also worked with the Canadian Jewish community in a variety of causes. For example, he sat as the Canadian board member of the Jerusalem Foundation at the request of Teddy Kollek. He was also honorary national chairman of the Bora Alaskan Endowed Scholarship Fund of Yeshiva University. He was the honorary chairman of the Canadian Gathering of Holocaust, Jewish Holocaust survivors and their children held in Ottawa. In 1981, Lou was the honoree at a special tribute fundraising dinner in Ottawa of Ben Gurion University with the objective of raising money to sustain the Louis Rosminski Social Integration Endowment Fund. The funds from the endowment were used to ameliorate the condition of Sephardic Jews. In the first number of years, the funds and resources were directed to helping Ethiopian youngsters. Lou died in September 1998 at the age of 90. I want to finish my remarks with a couple of examples of Lou's delightful sense of humor. Every year, just before Christmas, the Bank of Canada invites past and senior officials to what is called the Old Guard Luncheon. At this event, the current governor talks about monetary policy developments and other developments of the Bank of Canada in the year just past. And the oldest former governor present responds to the current governor's presentation. At one such luncheon, I remember Lou beginning his remarks by apologizing for his longevity being a drain on the Bank of Canada's pension plan. And then going on to explain that his plan was to continue to be such a drain for a number of years. <laughs> As I mentioned, following his retirement, Lou was the honoree at a fundraising events, event for Ben Gurion University. One of the speakers at the event was Gerald Bowie, who had succeeded Lou as governor. In his remarks, Jerry recalled the occasion during the period when Lou was governor and he was senior deputy governor. He received a note from Lou, which read as follows. I will not be at work tomorrow since Yom Kippur, the, whole, the day of atonement, atonement the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. It is a day, on, a day on which we fast and pray for forgiveness for sins of commission and omission, of which there were none this past year in monetary policy. <laughs> Lou Resminski was a wonderful man, a great Canadian, and one of whom the Canadian Jewish community was justly proud. As his biographer Bruce Muirhead wrote, Resminski overcame great odds to become governor in 1961 following the coin affair and in the process demonstrate great reserves of character. But that strength was not surprising, given his background and experience. The very fact of being Jewish, which had prevented him from becoming governor earlier, had long ago given him the ethical and moral fiber to deal with life. Back to you, Rabbi. Thank you very much, uh, Chuck. What you succeeded in doing is uh, convincing us, uh, not that we needed convincing, that this was a truly giant of a person, a truly great man, and uh, those of us who are blessed to, to be in his generation, we realize now retroactively how lucky we are, how lucky we were, and how lucky 
Canada was and continues to be because of him. It is now a great pleasure to call on uh, Lou's uh, dear son, uh, Michael, who is Emeritus Professor of Neurology at McGill University. What is Emeritus? I don't even know what Emeritus means. Uh, right. Uh, and um, he's a senior physician at uh, Montreal General Hospital and a lovely guy. For those of you who didn't hear what uh, it means to be an emeritus professor, it means I'm an AK. <laughs> um, where's Chuck? Thank you for that uh, lovely talk about uh, Dad. Um, you and I have just a basically nodding acquaintance, but in fact we go back a very long time when I was 11, 12 years old. I had Hebrew lessons from Rabbi Kravitz, and I can remember going to his house on Sunday mornings and seeing a pigtailed uh, young Aviva hiding behind her mother's skirts. <laughs> and now we're both AKs. <laughs> <laughs> time, time passes. Um, I made a couple of notes as Chuck was talking. Um, you were talking about the uh, meeting of the IMF where um, um, uh, uh, Keynes came down the stairs and I was, I, I was going to tell that story until you told it. But I have another story to tell uh, about Dad's um, getting the job in Geneva, um, which you may not know. Um, he was 22 at the time, I guess, and this job was, was, was advertised in the billboard at the London School of Economics, and he applied for it. And there was a, um, um, an, an interview. He made the short list, and he got to the interview. The interview started in English, and that went well. And um, it then continued in French, which he spoke, and that went well. And then they switched to German, which was a lingua franca of the time. Um, and Dad spoke pretty good Yiddish, um, <laughs> and his German wasn't bad. It was Ontario High School German, and that went well. And then somebody in the panel said to him, do you speak Spanish? <laughs> he didn't speak Spanish, but he figured he was on a roll, and he figured that nobody on the panel spoke Spanish. And he said, well, I have a little Spanish. <laughs> and they didn't question him in Spanish, and he did indeed get the job. <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased that Gordon Thiessen is also going to uh, speak. Um, Dad was um, treated very warmly by his three successors as the governor of the bank. He was uh, particularly pleased that uh, his deputy governor, Jerry Bowie, became his successor. Um, John Crow was the next governor, and I always slightly had the feeling that he was usurping my status as his favorite son. <laughs> um, and uh, my sister Lola, who uh, is, uh, could not be here today, but you'll hear from her in a bit. I see her on the screen ahead of me. Um, uh, still very good friends with John and Ruth Crow in Toronto. Um, uh, I have less insight into Dad's relationship with you, uh, Mr. Thiessen, but I do recall one memorable encounter with you. I think the only one we've ever had. I went into the bank shortly after Dad died to pick up some of his personal papers, and I think you got wind of the fact that I was in the bank and invited me to come into your office, Dad's old office, for a talk. Um, and I remember what you, you said. You recalled an incident when you were a young um, researcher in the uh, research department, and you'd written a paper, um, and uh, Dad took you aside after it was presented and was very complimentary about it. And he wasn't complimentary so much about the substance of the paper, um, but about the, the deft way you'd use language in, 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 in writing it. And that was something he cared about a great deal. Um, I have a quote here. This preoccupation with language is perhaps best epitomized in something he wrote many years later. Um, when he was summarizing his experience as the chair of the drafting committee of the uh, Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, and Chuck, Chuck has spoken of that, he says, I take a certain pride in the coherence and virtual absence of unintended ambiguities in this complicated document. <laughs> so, Mr. Thiessen, you perhaps qualify as number three favorite son. <laughs> Um, when Tova Lynch asked me to speak at this event, I was in a bit of a quandary about what would be appropriate to say. There's really no precedent for an occasion like this. So let me just share with you a few random personal recollections. 
Um, uh, Chuck referred to Dad having grown up in a rich Jewish milieu in Kensington Market area of Toronto. Um, and he's talked about some of his young activities in, in, um, in Jewish life. Uh, one of the things he did was to uh, spend a couple of summers as a counselor at Camp Moden, which was known as the camp with the Jewish ideal, um, which my father said freely translated mean they didn't pay their counselors. <laughs> And he never spoke to me about this, but apparently he thought at one point of becoming either a rabbi or an academic. Um, those, for him for the ro those for him were the roads not taken. Um, for me, the roads not taken was a career in uh, musical theater, which I didn't take but to my mother's eternal relief. <laughs> Um, nonetheless, after a dalliance with that in university and in medical school, I continued to keep my hand in from time to time uh, writing songs for uh, family occasions like my father's 75th birthday. And um, I can't forgo, to, can't forgo the opportunity to quote just a fragment of the lyrics from the song that I wrote and that Lola and I sang together on that occasion. And perhaps if Lola's mic's turned on, she can chip in at the appropriate point. Um, I won't sing, uh, but uh, I should tell you that, that as, an, as an academic myself, I understand the imperative of recirculating one's material. <laughs> Lou thought one time he'd be a scholar, but he wound up signing dollars. What a thing to do, from Kensington and Brunswick. Lou even thought he'd be a rabbi, but our mother said, have I another thought or two on what a Jew should do? Pulpit academ forsworn, bureaucrats are made, not born. In the end, it turned out fine for your father. Father and for mine. <laughs> and for mine, she's supposed to say. And 15 years later, we were celebrating his longevity on his 90th birthday. Here's a selection of the song from that. Um, he's a true world-class survivor, this nonagenarian man. He's the oldest central banker alive, unless Jakobson's surfaced in Azerbaijan. <laughs> he can still contrive to be youthful, Despite his enormous lifespan, this nonagenarian, non alzheimerian man. <laughs> Our nonagenarian, non alzheimerian never-rotarian or rastafarian, <laughs> nonagenarian, soon centenarian pa. Even though he didn't make it to 100, he never forgot his Jewish roots. Um, as everyone here knows, his appointment as the governor of the Bank of Canada was a very big deal for the Canadian Jewish community. This was at the time the most important appointment to the Canadian public service, Jewish appointment, and he was certainly aware of its symbolic significance to a country where only 20 years previously, uh, none is too many was the watchword of the Department of External Affairs. Um, I have a clear memory, and uh, Chuck's referred to this reception uh, that was held for him uh, by the Ottawa Jewish community shortly after his appointment in 1961. Um, this event is in a sense a bookend to that. Um, I can't recall whether he said it to me or possibly in the short speech that he gave on that occasion, um, but the message was that he wasn't going to forget where he came from, and he didn't. Um, an example of that was the night before Judy and I were married, and uh, here I have to back up a bit. Uh, my father's highest form of praise was to say that something was very satisfactory, <laughs> as in describing Lola and me as very satisfactory children. Um, when I brought Judy home for the first time to meet the folks um, a few months after we'd started dating, I can recall a conversation with him. We were driving together, just the two of us in a, in a car, and uh, in uh, his rather gruff and diffident manner, he used a uh, horse race, horse racing metaphor to say, I think she's a real starter. <laughs> this was clearly a very, very strong st st uh, stamp of approval. <laughs> Judy and I had our ups and downs, but a couple of years later, um, we were uh, decided rather precipitously to get married, or more precisely, Judy finally caved. <laughs> And um, the deed was done within a month at a small ceremony in Judy's godmother's house in uh, Judy's godmother's apartment in New York. A dinner was arranged for the night before the wedding for the parents to meet each other for the first time. 
and we had some considerable apprehensions about this. Um, Judy's parents were all lefties. Her father was a Hollywood screenwriter who'd been blacklisted during the McCarthy era, and um, they lived in constant fear that the FBI was lurking just outside the house. Um, and they lived rather hand to mouth on Judy's earnings as a, um, as a dance teacher. Um, their idea of luxury would have been an evening at McDonald's. Um, my parents traveled first class, and the dinner was arranged for the night before the wedding in the Plaza Hotel in, in New York. Well, we need not have worried about the encounter between the old commies and the avatars of the establishment. Um, Judy's mother grew up on the Lower East Side of New York, and my father in the Kensington Market, Tor Toronto equivalent, and they immediately bonded on their shared experience. And it didn't hurt that my mother-in-law, former Martha Graham dancer, was extraordinarily beautiful even in her mid-50s. Um, as many here know, my father always took, took great pleasure in being around attractive women. <laughs> uh, ultimately, the two sets of parents became very good friends. Um, Judy, who's American, got her first insight into the importance of uh, my father to the Canadian Jewish community when we moved to Montreal in 1973. Um, we'd spent the first few years of our marriage when he was governor in the relative anonymity of New York and London and Paris. And when we first came to Canada, she was buffaloed by how small a country this is um, and by the instant name recognition. I, on the other hand, found this a very useful tool in my early neurologic practice if I encountered an elder, elderly Jewish patient who didn't say to me, are you related to Lou Razminsky? I would regard this as prima facie evidence of dementia. <laughs> <laughs> friends were very important to my father. Um, and it's lovely to see so many old friends here um, who remember Dad well. The friends of his vintage are, are virtually all gone, but he had an extraordinary capacity to make new and younger friends. Most of them now, like me, very definitely, definitively geriatric. Um, I must first mention Jerry Gray, his companion, or as he described his special friend of the last 15 years with whom we still have a warm uh, friendship. Uh, Jill Stern, where are you, Jill? Brings back memories of Michael and Joan Comey. Um, Michael was the first Israeli ambassador to Canada. We spent any number of Sunday evenings uh, either at their house watching uh, the Ed Sullivan show <laughs> or at the Canton Inn. And we had a Canton Inn memorial dinner just before this uh, uh, event tonight. Um, when at Evelyn Greenberg's suggestion after Dad died, we gave the family piano to the Israeli embassy and there was a little ceremony uh, about that. I said that this really isn't a gift to the Israeli embassy, it's a gift to the Comey's house. Um, and they remained lifelong friends. Um, had we known a little earlier about this, uh, certainly Susanna Dolphin would have been here, but she's in Newfoundland with Lola. Um, Jerry Gray was introduced to Passover Seders at um, Chuck and Susanna's house and also at the home of Beryl and Alti Radal. I saw Beryl here. There you are. Um, I'm told that there were extensive exegeses of the Haggadah at both, both Seders. Um, Dad used to complain it went on much too long. <laughs> he never got home until about 3 in the morning from your Seders. <laughs> um, seeing Evelyn Greenberg here, my old high school flame, um, <laughs> reminds, you didn't know that, uh, <laughs> reminds me of a story of when he was in mid-80s. Um, my dad and Jerry went on a, a tour to Spain that Evelyn was leading, and she took him uh, for his first uh, trip to a, a topless beach. And uh, after they'd been on the beach for a few minutes, uh, she said to him, Lou, what do you think about it? And uh, he said, well, you've seen two, you've seen them all. <laughs> and uh, Chuck, you stole my thunder. I was going to tell a story about uh, 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 Dad's note to Jerry Bowie on uh, Arab Yom Kippur, where he said he would be in shul the next day atoning for his sins, none of them, of course, in the field of monetary policy. <laughs> um, I can only recall one incident where my father disappointed me. When I was seven years old, I was given to understand that I was going to meet the king. Um, this, is, you can imagine, was very exciting. I was taken down to the old Union Station. 
uh, where my father was getting on the train to uh, San Francisco for the founding meeting of uh, the United Nations in 1945. Um, and you can imagine um, how disappointed I saw when the king, as it turned out, was not wearing the expected crown, but instead was an elderly gentleman with a Homburg and spats, um, in my memory looking very much like the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> who took the insufferable liberty of patting me on the head. Um, this was Mackenzie King, and it was, of course, deeply disappointing to a young royalist. <laughs> but uh, only temporarily shook my confidence in uh, my father. It was a confidence that never again was uh, seriously shaken. After that rocky start, I and certainly Lola felt warmly and lovingly supported by him. In preparation for this, I've been trying to think of some advice he might have given me. Um, but although he certainly had no hesitation in advising, in advising prime ministers, finance ministers, and other central bank governors, it was not his style to offer explicit advice to his children. Uh, the advice was always implicit, and it had to do with his being an exemplar of, of personal integrity, honesty, and caring for others. Um, I looked recently at a file that I have of the very few letters I have uh, from him. One is dated in 1978. Um, this was soon after the Quebec election that brought the first PQ government to power. Um, there was considerable panic in the Anglo community about how things were going to turn out, and McGill was being raided by universities all over the country. Um, uh, who, looking for academics who wanted to bail out of Quebec. Um, our neuro neurology neuroscience group was being wooed by UBC, and several of us went out to Vancouver to have a serious look. Um, this was just a couple of years after our mother had died and dad was still feeling very bereft. And I must have, um, uh, we'd been seeing a lot of him at the time, I must have expressed some anxiety to a friend about uh, the possibility of our being so, so far away. Uh, he somehow got wind of this conversation and he wrote me a letter addressing the question of the implications for him of our possibly moving to Vancouver. Um, I want to make it as clear as I can that when you factor this consideration into the difficult decision-making process, you should give it a weight of precisely zero. I would, in fact, be greatly upset if you did otherwise, and, and so on. Um, I can't recall any other occasion in which he gave me explicit advice, except perhaps to agree that Judy was a real starter. <laughs> <laughs> and although he didn't tell me to marry her, in the end, was enormously pleased that I, that I did. Um, so finally, let me take just a moment to address the anti-Semitism the anti -Semitism elephant in the room in an event like this. Um, but before I do that, let me create a context. Uh, I joined the Faculty of Medicine at McGill in 1973. At that time, the numerous clauses for Jewish students um, entering the medical school uh, was still in living memory. It was still in effect until the late 1950s, I think. Um, in the 40s and 50s, a prominent Jewish physician in Montreal, who was known as the Gauleiter, was assigned the task of choosing four Jewish boys, and they were always boys, um, to enter the, the McGill Medical School. Um, the other Jewish boys with medical aspirations became pharmacists, and that's the reason there were so many Jewish pharmacists in Montreal in the, in the late 20th century. Um, when I came to Montreal, our medical students were virtually all either WASPs or French Canadian or Jewish, and there was a smattering of American students. More than 40 years later, I'm now pretty much superannuated, but I still keep my hand in with a little bit of teaching, and I do a couple of weeks each year of intensive teaching of second-year medical students in, in a group of six or seven students. Um, the last group that I taught was entirely typical, in as much as there were five first languages represented among the six students, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, and Vietnamese. We've come a long way in this country in the last 50 years. Um, well, with that context, let me return to the speculation about the role that anti-Semitism may have played in um, the fact that my father was not named governor of the bank until 1961, and Chuck's alluded to some of the machinations. Um, I can recall only one conversation about this, and it was certainly initiated by me. It's not a conversation that he would have initiated. Um, there's no question that early on, um, he had his eye on the job of governor. Uh, one of my childhood memories is when I was 11 years old, um, 
in, I guess it was 1949, uh, seeing my parents going out to dinner one night. My father was clearly terribly upset about something. Um, this was, um, in retrospect, clearly the day that um, um, uh, Jim Klein was appointed as deputy governor to succeed Donald Gordon. Uh, Dad had hoped to have that, that job. Um, and this, this put Coyne squarely in place to succeed Graham Towers as the governor of the bank. Um, and Coyne was, of course, appointed in 1955 as Towers' successor. Um, Dad had hoped to become governor at that time, but he easily made his peace with the fact that as the deputy governor, Coyne was the logical choice as governor, as successor to Towers, and he chose to regard it as an issue about which reasonable people could disagree and never really made much of an issue of it. Some years later, when he was governor, uh, he made a speech one morning in Quebec City. The son of Louis Saint Laurent, the former prime minister, uh, was in the audience and he made himself known to my father after the speech. Dad asked to be remembered to his father. Um, Saint Laurent Fils said that he saw his father for lunch every day and would convey Dad's regards. And he came back later in the afternoon um, with a message from the old man. Um, he said he wanted my father to know that he wanted to appoint him governor of the bank in 1955, but the pressure from the Montreal bankers not to appoint a Jew had been overwhelming. Um, and he was now, as an old man, very glad to get this off his chest. So take that for what it's worth. Um, I, when I discuss cases with, with uh, my students and residents, uh, at the end I like to say, well, what is the, what is the, what is the take home here? And uh, I think that the take home here is that the next time somebody, uh, there's an appointment of somebody who's Jewish as the governor of the Bank of Canada, it's going to be an absolute non-event, uh, number one. Um, and uh, secondly, and similarly, what a long way we've come as we celebrate uh, the 150th year of uh, Canada's confederation. Um, so as Lola and I said in our song for Dad's 75th birthday, um, in the end it turned out fine um, for your father and for mine. He was certainly very conscious that it had worked out fine. After he retired as the governor of the bank, he wrote, uh, and again I'm quoting him here, I have been very fortunate in my professional as well as my personal life. I can also remember him saying that he was particularly lucky to have had work that he found interesting and that he appreciated all of those around him whom he regarded as taking part, and again, these are his words, in a continuous conspiracy to work as hard as they could to try to make me look good. Uh, Mr. Thiessen was certainly one of the people who did that. Um, finally, I think that his most telling judgment about the reason for his success in life was what he once said to me, I liked people, and I think they liked me. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for helping us to remember our beloved father. Lola, you have something you're going to say now? Yes, I, I, I will add. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. We're turning you around. Uh, Michael, as, as Dad would say, that was a very satisfactory talk. <laughs> and I just want to add one or two anecdotes uh, to sort of fill out the picture. Um, one happened when I was at, coming to the end of my first year at the University of Toronto in 1963, and I was in a little bit of a panic about my exams, especially my economics exam. So I called Dad and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. He said, well, why don't you come home and I'll, I'll see if I can help you out. So I came home and he had a pile of books as high as his bed mostly textbooks, economics textbooks, he said to the librarian, I'm pretty sure I know enough economics to run the Bank of Canada, but I'm not sure I could pass a first year economics exam. <laughs> so he coached me for the weekend, and I have to say to this day, I feel a little bit guilty that uh, I got the only A plus I ever got in, in my university because of his help. Then, fast forward, he, I always felt totally supported by him 
uh, as a father. Fast forward about 30 years later when um, my son Jeremy was in his first year at uh, Yale and um, um, Chuck mentioned Bretton Woods. That was the 50th anniversary of Bretton Woods and he took Jeremy um, with him to that anniversary and it seemed to have quite an impact on on my son who then went on to study economics I should I, I should call it that let the me just the best trip that dad ever made was to Jeremy's graduation where I remember him sitting out in the rain in the quad um, watching Jeremy graduate with the the economics prize which he was very very proud of um, the other anecdote that I wanted to share, because I'm, I remain inspired by this story, um, Michael mentioned Dad's special friend, Jerry Gray, who's with you tonight, and, and she was 30-some years younger than he was, um, and he really tried his best to keep up with her, and I remember one day I was in Ottawa visiting for the weekend, and she invited us to go to a friend's exhibit, uh, art exhibit, somewhere at the Gatineau, I think it was. And we got there, and the exhibit was in a kind of tree house. It was way, way up. The, the stairs to get up to uh, the exhibit were almost like a ladder. And I was thinking, I don't think you can do this. But he insisted on climbing up. All, all those stairs um, or rungs, we thought we'd have to get the fire department to bring them, bring them back down. Uh, but he, that was just an example of how he felt that you know if something's worth doing. You would just go all out and go for it, even if it means you're uncomfortable. You're, you have to step outside your comfort zone, and that's been a real inspiration to me. And he remains an inspiration to uh, all of our children, Michael's children too, because uh, he just cared a lot. He spent a lot of time and was incredibly considerate, um, always wanting the best for all of us. He'll always be with us. Thanks for letting me tune in. Thanks, Michael and Lola. That was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Just remember that people who are great public figures uh, that can find the time and the wherewithal to be also great parents, that just uh, escalates our appreciation of them. It's a wonderful pleasure to uh, welcome uh, the sixth governor of the bank who served in that capacity from 1994 to 2001. He worked at the bank for 38 years from 1963 to 2001, a, a very dignified and highly respected individual. It's a delight for us to have you here with us, uh, Gordon Thiessen, and please welcome. Well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here and to have a chance to speak, although I must say, after Chuck's presentation and the wonderful comments you've heard from Michael and Lola, I'm not sure that there's much to add to that. Uh, so I will just add a, a few comments about life at the Bank of Canada when Lou was the governor. I worked under him for 10 years. You've heard all the crucial things of Lou's career from Chuck, so I'm just gonna try and add a little bit of color at the bank, what was like at the bank uh, during Lou's uh, terms as governor. As you've heard, I arrived in the summer of 1963. That was two years after he'd been named governor. And at the time, the bank, as you've heard from Chuck, was still coming to terms with the events of 1961, when James Coyne had essentially been fired by the uh, Diefenbaker government. And the staff at the bank at the time was all rather distressed about the way Coyne had been treated. And most of the bank supported him in what he had done, but the economic analysis side of the bank 
um, felt that in part Coyne had been some of the author of his own misfortune. They had been at odds with the, the, uh, some of the views that he'd taken, especially the campaign that he followed at one point about Canadians living beyond their means. And the view was that he was straying rather too far from the mandate of the bank, and they disputed some of the economics that was underlying the coin view. And the bank, at the time I came, was really seriously split as a result. And what Lou had to do in his first years of governor was to basically ensure that the bank would operate cohesively, that they repair the loss of confidence in the bank. And he was perfect for the job. As you've heard, he was the bank's deputy governor on international matters. Uh, he had not been involved in the coin affair. And everyone, everyone knew about his role at Bretton Woods setting up the International Monetary Fund and the new International Monetary System. And Lou was the representative of the bank and of Canada at international meetings, so within the bank, he was widely admired and respected. He also was the most perfect image for a central bank governor, none of us could match that, elegant and eloquent. And so Lou was able to repair the damage done to the bank with the coin affair internally and rebuild its reputation. As you've heard, his term did not start easily. Uh, the mismanagement of the currency by the Diefenbaker government, uh, there was subsequently a need to stabilize a falling Canadian dollar and uh, by moving back to the fixed exchange rate. Of course, as a Bretton Woods participant, Lou was quite happy to see the bank back on the, in the good graces of the IMF and part of the IMF system of fixed exchange rates. And it is sort of ironic that Canada had to leave that system and return to a floating rate currency in 1970, right near the end of Lou's term as governor. I don't actually remember in the debates at that time that he opposed it because we really didn't have a choice at that time. We really, there was no choice but to let the dollar float. And I must say, for the most part, the fixed exchange rate between 1962 and 1970 was kind of non-controversial in Canada. And it really did help Lou reestablish the bank's good reputation. And it also enabled him to keep, a or enabled the bank, I should say, to have a low public profile. Lou felt it was necessary after the coin years when the bank was so frequently a matter of dispute in the press and in Parliament that the bank should keep a rather lower profile uh, than, than before. And it probably was the right strategy, but I have to say to you, it, the Canadian public never really got to know Lou Razminski the way they know central bank governors these days. Of course, he was well known and highly respected and appreciated in uh, the financial community and, and internationally. But the fact that ordinary Canadians didn't know them as they know Steve Paulus or Mark Carney, I think is too bad because this was a man that they could, should well have known and appreciated. Now the bank as, was a relatively hierarchical institution in my early days. So that Michael has already told you about my, the very first time that I got called up to see the governor in his office. And it was uh, in the late 1960s Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago was getting a lot of attention calling central banks to pay more attention to the supply of money in running monetary policy. And so in the bank's research department, we were asked to prepare a paper on monetarism and present it to the senior officers of the bank. Well, a group, it was a group effort. I, in the bank terminology, held the pen and made the presentation. Uh, 
A day or so later, as you've heard from Michael, I got this call that the governor wanted to see me. I have to tell you, I was seriously worried at the time. I thought, what had we done? Had the, had the presentation in the paper really been inappropriate? And as you've heard from Michael, he, we had this conversation. Of course, Governor Razminski, in his usual way, put me at ease. Uh, but the main point he wanted to pass on to me, as you've heard, was that the paper was very well written and well presented. And I was really kind of taken aback at that. Uh, I thought we were here to have a big debate about Milton Friedman and monetarism. And I have to tell you that it was only many years later when I was sitting in the governor's chair that I finally understood what Lou was say, trying to say to me. The governor of the Bank of Canada, you know, is a bit like the chief economist for Canada. And he or she is expected to be able to explain and give advice on economic issues that affect Canada. And there are always a lot of issues. So that a briefing paper that's well written and clearly explains an issue means that you as governor are able to deal with it in public in an authoritative way. And let me tell you, that's incredibly helpful. <laughs> Finally, because nobody else has mentioned it, I must tell you about Lou, the art aficionado of the bank. Now, when I arrived in 1963, a decision had been made to build a new building. It didn't actually get started until 1969. Uh, but the wonderful building we have today is the result of one person, Lou Resminski. Nobody, nobody else would have hired the avant-garde Arthur Erickson to build a new building for the Bank of Canada. And Arthur Erickson was encouraged to join the bank's traditional architects and surround the original Bank of Canada building with these reflective glass towers that are now regarded as architectural gems. I mean, it really was extraordinary. And people who saw the Bank of Canada building said to us, my goodness, that's glorious, but it doesn't look like a central bank, you know. <laughs> a central bank and glass buildings? Because they, central bank buildings were always built as fortresses. The other thing I have to mention is that the year or so before he retired, Lou ensured that the bank's modest art budget was fully spent. He didn't trust his successors to be all that good at spending the art budget. So most, most well-known Canadian artists are featured on the walls of the Bank of Canada. Although most of them were not well known at the time that Lou arranged for their purchases. But I tell you, what a legacy he left. When you do a tour of the Bank of Canada and you see the art that's on the walls, it's extraordinary. Finally, just let me underline what Chuck said about Lou's contribution to the governance of the Bank of Canada. The changes that he required before he would accept the position of governor and that were subsequently, subsequently put in the Bank of Canada Act, they have been crucial to clarifying the bank's role as an autonomous agency operating with the framework, within the framework of a democratic government. He made clear the relationship between the governor and the government. And I have to tell you, every last one of his successors have been grateful for those changes. It just made a situation so much clearer. So as you've heard, here we are 56 years later, and we still marvel, I certainly still marvel, at how Lou Resminski was able to change the framework under which the Bank of Canada operates and to make it a more successful and respected Canadian institution. Thanks very much. So, uh, Gordon, I, I don't have that good a memory, but I know that during the time that you were the governor and the people that I knew that were in the bank, 
Uh, one of the things that resonates in me is the description that they had of you, which was that you're a real mensch, <laughs> uh, which is probably the highest satisfactory it was Lou. <laughs> mensch is the equivalent of satisfactory. Uh, we're working on a little bit of a deadline. The building here closes at 9. So uh, what I would like to do now very quickly is firstly, of course, to thank Tover for arranging this. Uh, to thank the Chuck for, uh, or Dr. Charles Friedman more formally, for this wonderful presentation that he made tonight. Uh, To thank Dr. Michael and Lola for their uh, wonderful insights into uh, Lou, not only as governor, but Lou as the, as the father and husband. And uh, to Gordon Thiessen for uh, his contribution. So thank you so much. This is all part and parcel of our um, getting together in the 150th year to express our gratitude for living in this uh, wonderful country a and to realize that uh, Lou probably didn't at, his, at that time, uh, but very uh, clearly became a, uh, a frontier person because when you think about some of the things that happened after he left, uh, and some were going on at the same time, uh, the fact that uh, we had Boyle Alaskan as uh, Supreme Court Justice, Robert Kaplan and Herb Gray, and other great luminaries over the course of time, he basically broke the barrier. And after that, it was open season and uh, Jewish people were able to flourish and to contribute to Canada the way they had always wanted, but unfortunately were not able. So here we are tonight, and it's quite ironic, uh, as uh, you know, money is always about currency, the currency that you have hanging over there, which had Lou's uh, signature, doesn't even exist anymore. The dollar bill. But Lou's memory, it exists. And thanks to tonight, it will, we will all leave with a greater appreciation of a truly great Canadian, a truly great Jewish person, uh, whom we were all privileged to know, us from the AK generation that Michael talked about. So thank you very much for coming. It's been a pleasure. And the drive home safely. The rest of the time, please enjoy interacting with each other. There are a little, some refreshments at the end, please enjoy them. <laughs>